Okay, I hope you can see my slides. Um, and if you can't, please yell. Um, the major, the, the next topic that we're gonna talk about is when are cells most sensitive to radiation during the cell cycle? Now, I, this is going to be the beginning of a few lectures that are gonna talk about the four R's of radiobiology, although we will also introduce a fifth R, which is frequently discussed. So um, the, the, the um, radio sensitivity in the cell cycle begins with um, a very kind of primitive discussion that came about in the early years uh, when people were defining what they could in the cell cycle and when they could only see under the light microscope was M phase and everything else. So they called um, M phase, which lasts about an hour, mitosis, and then the remainder of the time they called interphase. And that, that is still called interphase now. So interphase is everything except M during the cell cycle. Um, the, the T sub C or the, the cell cycle mitotic time is the entire time it takes to go through mitosis. Um, now, here was the M phase that was being uh, identified under the microscope. Here was S phase, which was possible to monitor by measuring DNA synthesis. And so then they put the gap one between the two of these and the gap two on the other end of these. And um, this is what we have as our cell cycle. One point I need to make here is the majority of cells in our body are in G0 phase. Um, the majority of cells in a tumor are probably in G1 phase. If there is ever a question about in the cell cycle versus out of the cell cycle, that is, G0 phase versus everything else, the cells in G0 phase are the most radio resistant phase of the cell, uh, 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 are the most radio resistant phase. G0 itself is not actually a phase of the cell cycle, it's out of the cycle, but G0 is always more resistant than anything in the cell cycle. Please remember that for your boards, they try to trip you up on that. Um, so here we go, G1, S, G2, M, uh, go through the cell cycle. <clears throat> and one thing that we would note is that in M phase, we see these beautiful chromosomes. Um, there's a condensation that goes on and we can see them. Whereas during other phases of the cell cycle, G0, G1, we see the DNA just spread out everywhere. And this shows pretty much the same thing. Okay. At each phase of the cell cycle, there are checkpoints. Um, in this diagram, Hall emphasizes the G2 checkpoint, which is probably the most important for radiation. Um, when we irradiate cells, the most common checkpoint that gets hit in is the G2 checkpoint. Um, but there are checkpoints in virtually every phase of the cell cycle. So there is a checkpoint at the end of G1, which is also important from a radiation perspective. Why is there a checkpoint here? If you irradiate or damage the cells during G1 phase, um, you don't want the cells to go through S phase synthesizing their uh, DNA if they have damaged DNA. There is a checkpoint in S phase where um, replication is halted. If the replication if machinery is damaged in some ways, you don't want the genome, you want to protect the genome, you don't want damaged DNA to be going through uh, synthesis phase. There is that important checkpoint I just mentioned at G2 um, where uh, uh, th there's a block to, pre to prevent replication of the cell. And then finally, there's one in M phase, uh, anaphase actually, if the chromatids are not properly assembled on mitotic spindles. So every single phase of the cell cycle has a, cell, a checkpoint G0 phase, which is out of the cell cycle, doesn't. Um, so therefore we've defined these things called checkpoint genes, their expression, going up or down controls gene cell cycle progression. It ensures the correct order of the events that occur during the cell cycle. And um, it was first identified in yeast and then applied to humans. Um, as I said already, the G2 checkpoint is probably the most important and the secondary one is the G1 one checkpoint. G1 is mediated almost exclusively by P53. Um, whereas P53 is used in the G2 checkpoint, but not essential for it. Now we are going to talk about the check one, check two genes and their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, relationship with ATM. 
um, a little bit later in this course, but I just wanted to bring up the checkpoint gene so that it's clear. Now, I don't want you to confuse any of these with the so-called restriction point or R point. The R point occurs late in G1, and it's the period during which the cells are responsive to mitogenic um, growth factors and uh, uh, signaling. And then after the R point, the cells are no longer responsive to growth factor uh, signaling. So therefore, this becomes uh, a very important point but it's not related to cell cycle checkpoints. We'll talk a lot in here about progression through the cell cycle. Here are the cyclins that are being orchestrated as the cell moves from M to G1 to S to G2. Um, these cyclins drive it and the cyclin dependent kinases, the CDKs drive the cyclins. Um, we will spend some time in here looking at that in much greater detail. This is an orchestrated event. Um, there is some information in Hall's textbook that's not true and some that is true, and we'll talk about that. This is just a pretty picture to show you uh, what's happening here. Uh, the cells are getting ready to divide. The chromosomes are lighting up on the um, axial plate. The chromosomes are being pulled into daughter cells, and the full cell division takes place. Okay. Um, so early studies on stu doing cell cycle analysis said, um, let's compare two different cell types. There are Chinese hamster ovary cells and there are HeLa cells, Chinese hamster cells. They're both transformed. They're both um, carcin uh, cells that have been, um, that are cancers. Let's compare them for their cell cycle time. So the total cell cycle time for the Cho cells was 11 hours. But for the HeLa cells, it was double that. It was 24 hours. So they asked the question, where, what's, what variation is there? How much variation is there in different phases of the cell cycle? Both spent one hour in M phase. Both spent six to eight hours in S phase. Both spent three to four hours in G2, but it was during G1 phase of the cell cycle, there was great variation. Cho cells were only one hour. Um, HeLa cells were actually tenfold longer. So um, from this, it was concluded that um, G1 is the most variable, variable phase of the cell cycle in length, and that's going to have implications for us in a moment when we talk about radiation sensitivity <clears throat> during the cell cycle. And while, while these data were all done in vitro, this is also true in vivo. We'll look at that much later when we look at cell cycle times of tumors um, inside organisms, in, including humans. But the fact is that G1 remains the most variable phase of the cell cycle, and that's frequently a question that's asked for boards. Okay, so how did they look, do these cell cycle experiments? Um, in, I had mentioned just a few moments ago the triadimidine experiment with, that they used to prove that, um, that nuclear DNA was the genetic material. Well, triadimidine is also used to follow cells as they're progressing through the cell cycle. So what you do is you, you use this uh, H3, the, the tritium label, on, uh, on, on thymidine. And it's taken up by the DNA selectively, not by any other parts in the cell. It does not accumulate in large pools. So it incorporates into the DNA. And what you can do is let the, um, put it on a stain, add a photographic emulsion, and within anywhere from a week to a month, you can develop it. Wherever you see a black spot, that's where beta particle was emitted. You can count the black grains and that gives you how many cells were undergoing DNA synthesis. You can increase the magnification and actually see chromosomes. And um, you can increase or change the length of time the cells are incubated with it to allow them to have different periods of label during the cell cycle. This technique is called auto radiography, um, which means self labeling because you're just adding the triadimidine and you're letting the cells take it up. Um, let me just show you, just uh, so you um, can, can see it. Here is autoradiography with triadimidine in uh, Chinese hamster ovary cells. Here, is, here are the silver grains. You can see how black they are. This is um, using a different kind of photographic emulsion, but again, you still see black spots in here. Okay, so here's the method. Triadimidine is added to the cells, they go through the cell cycle, they pick up the label, and you look at them uh, 
anywhere from a week to a month later for their label. Because this took so long, and because it used radio label, people came up with a new method. And the new method is using bromodeoxyuridine. Look at the bromodeoxyuridine here. The bromo group is a bulky group, and it takes the place of the methyl group here on the thymidine. So while it's a uridine, it incorporates into the DNA like thymidine. So it's a mimic of thymidine. You add this to cells, it gets taken up, and you then make an antibody against the bromo group, the bromodeoxyuridine, and a secondary antibody that binds to this that's fluorescein labeled. And now we have a means of detecting that does not require radioactivity. I need to say now that remembering bromodeoxyuridine is going to be very important. It is being used here to monitor cells in the cell cycle. It's going to be used later as a radiosensitizer. Because it's got those two applications in the radiation field, they often ask it on the boards. So you need to know that it does both. Um, okay, here's the example. Take the bromodeoxyuridine. It replaces the triethymidine. Um, it has the same kinetics of incorporation as uh, triethymidine. It's much more commonly used because there's no radio label. Um, you can observe it with the fluorescent label. Um, and it measures cells mostly that are in S phase. Uh, they both measure cells in the first mitosis. And the advantages are it's no radioactivity. And the time to develop it is short. Remember I said for the um, triethymidine method, you need about a week to a month to detect it. Here, you can just detect it with your fluorescein label right away. Here's what it looks like. Here, is, here are cells that just got the tritium label. You can see these black spots. Here is the bromodeoxyuridine. You can see this kind of pinkish color. And here is the combination of both in the same cell. Direct overlap, what bromodeoxyuridine, uh, what, what thymidine measures, bromodeoxyuridine measures easily. What did they learn from all these studies that they did? These are all going to be obvious to us today, but at the time they were surprising. Number one, cells synthesize DNA only in a discrete phase of the cell cycle that they called S phase. Number two, that the interval between M and S uh, was a time when no DNA synthesis occurred at all. They called this gap one, or G1 for short. There was a second gap after DNA synthesis that they called G2. And then this progression from M to G1 to S to G2 occurs in all mammalian cells in that particular order. Um, never changing that order. The lengths of times for the phases may vary. And in particular, as we noted before, G1 is the most variable phase of the cell cycle, um, but it was significant. And again, I want to bring up this point. Here's M phase, here's interphase. Um, on your boards, if you see the word interphase, you should know that it includes G1, S, and G2. And they do sometimes ask that. Okay. Here is a diagram uh, from Hall's textbook that is actually accurate, uh, looking at the cyclins and the cyclin-dependent kinases. So here we have G0, a series of transcription factors that get turned on in G1 phase of the cell cycle. Um, G1 phase of the cell cycle is mediated by the, the D cyclins, particularly cyclin D1, and the phosphorylase, the kinase that acts here uh, I'm sorry, the, the, not the phosphorylase. Yeah, the, the kinase, which adds a phosphorus to the cyclin D1 to activate it, is called CDK4 or cyclin dependent kinase 4. At the G1 checkpoint, we would see P53 and RB. The transition from G1 to S requires cyclin E and cyclin dependent kinase 2. The progression through S requires cyclin A and cyclin dependent kinase 2 again. And then finally, G2 to M requires cyclins B and A and cyclin-dependent kinase 1. So there's an orchestration here, and you're going to need to memorize this orchestration. I think I have a better diagram in a, in a later lecture that includes a few other proteins that you need to do, you know. Um, so you can go from there. Now, I want to remind you that G1 in some cells is very short, and so you only have a plain G1. But in some cells, 
G1 is very long. And so that leads to an early G1 followed by a mid to late G1 that leads to SG2M. There are a lot of proteins involved in this and a lot of pathways. And this is not nearly complicated enough to explain uh, the kind of cell cycle regulation uh, that goes on within these cells. But we will talk about the check one and check two um, proteins which are involved in cell cycle checkpoint regulation. Um, the, this is, this is, would, would be a nice little movie, um, but I'm not gonna bother to show it because it just shows the cells going from G0 into G1 and progressing through the cell cycle. Um, in, in addition, you can see what's going on is the lineup of the uh, chromosomes, the grabbing on of the centromere by the um, spindle fibers and the pulling of the uh, chromosomes into daughter cells. Now I wanna emphasize that what we're talking about here is mitosis shown here at the bottom and not meiosis. Meiosis gives rise to eggs and sperm that occurs only in those selective germ cells. Um, we will talk about that when we talk about the reproductive system, but what we're talking about here is only mitosis, only somatic cells um, that are going to be playing a role. Okay, so now let's look at the rest of the cell cycle and ask the question, what is most sensitive and what is most resistant? Well, in order to do this, uh, you have to have cells that are actually synchronized in some way that you can follow through the cell cycle. So um, one approach that has been used and continues to be used for um, synchronization is to uh, have the cells growing on a plate. And as they get ready to go through M phase, they round up and come off the bottom of the plate. So if you pass the plate at that point in time and pour off the cells that fall off, those are cells in M phase. Everything else that's left are cells that are cycling but not in M phase or maybe somewhere in G0 phase. Um, but this mitotic shake off where you shake off the cells that are in M phase is a common approach to be able to synchronize. It does only work for those cells that grow in a monolayer culture. It won't work for anything else. A second method that's used, and you need to remember this, is the drug hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea um, kills cells in, M in S phase and it blocks the cells from entering into G1. So all cells get put into G2, M, and they progress through the cell cycle together. Here's what this looks like diagrammatically. Um, here we have the distribution of all the cells in the cell cycle. We now um, add uh, the, the hydroxyurea to the culture. We block the cells at G2, uh, I'm sorry, G1 phase of the cell cycle. They progress through in unison, and uh, here you can actually see them progressing through the cell cycle and they're in, in synchrony. Um, this is a common means, and hydroxyurea is the drug that does that, and you should remember that drug because it's going to have some other um, applications as we progress through these as well. Um, there are other methods to synchronize. We are going to talk about flow cytometry, which I believe is the best way to synchronize and now is the most commonly used not really discussed that well in Hall's textbook. And then centr centrifugal elutriation, um, which is where you would separate the cells based on size when you centrifuge them. Um, this is done still in some places, but it's not very commonly done. And I've never seen it on the boards. So here are uh, the two root, root tips that were synchronized with um, hydroxyurea. You can see the majority of the cells are in M phase, uh, preparing to divide. So it looks like it was a pretty successful. Um, synchronization. Okay, so now that we can synchronize the cells, we can ask the question, what is the most radiosensitive phase of the cell cycle? So what they did here is they took Chinese hamster ovary cells. Now remember, Cho cells are the ones with the short G1. Um, so they took these cells, they monitored them for the colony surviving fraction against the time after they did the shake off. They gave them a dose of 6.6 .6 gray, and they then do different survival times. What do they show? They show that M, G2 are very sensitive phase of the cell cycle. Late S is among the most radio resistant phases of the cell cycle. 
In fact, this is work that was done by Warren Sinclair when he was at Argonne National Laboratory um, a number of years ago. Warren passed away about two or three years ago now. But he did, I think, seminal work that uh, shows the most sensitive versus resistant phase of the cell cycle. These experiments are really key, and there are a number of things that are evident from these survival curves. So he did log the swine fraction against dose, looking at M and G2 phase cells, G1, early S, and late S phase cells. And he demonstrated a few things. First of all, M and, and G2, he lumped them together and said that they're equally radiosensitive. We'll look at that in a moment. There are times when M is more sensitive, there are times when G2 is more sensitive. The boards should not actually separate that for you. They should put them together. Um, but if you are forced to choose, you'll choose M over G2 for being most sensitive. Um, next are G1 phase cells, then early S, then late S cells being the most uh, resistant here. Um, here we have these M phase cells out here. What are these? These are M phase cells that have been treated under um, hypoxic conditions. So right away, what you can see is compare M phase in oxic versus hypoxic conditions. Hypoxia makes the cells be radio resistant. That's going to be an important theme for us. We're going to come back to it in um, two topics or three topics, but it is very a very important point. The second thing I want you to notice is the shape of the survival curve here is very different for each of these what you should see is the MG2 phase cells are having a um, survival curve that has no shoulder on it. Whereas when we get out here to early S, late S phase cells, there's a significant shoulder. What did we say in our survival curve situation? This is the definition of a curve that has only a, a that has no shoulder. We said that that's what we call single hit, sing, single target kinetics. We said there are three examples of cells having single hit, single target kinetics. The one we showed you at that time were cells that were exposed to high LET radiation, high energy radiation. Here we have the second example, which is cells that are in M phase of the cell cycle. Cells in M phase also show single hit, single target kinetics. The third example we'll see later, which is cells that are missing our DNA repair processes. So those are the three kinds of cells that undergo that are in single hit, single target kinetics. You've got to know that for your boards. That's a really important point. So I think that's about what we can learn from this uh, curve. Um, and uh, it's, I think, quite evident. But so now we go back to those two cells we looked at in the beginning, the ones with the short G1, the Chinese hamster ovary cells, and the ones with the longer G1, the HeLa cells. And what, what do we notice? We notice that the patterns of radiosensitivity are very similar except for here during G1. What happened in, in the HeLa cells with the late G1, remember it's 11 hours, compared to one hour in the, in the hamster, Chinese hamster ovary cells, is that we can actually see this, um, there's very little structure here, but here there's a lot of structure that we can see quite evidently in the HeLa cells. Um, and here there is a uh, resistant per period uh, late in G1. So the patterns were identical, except that you see more structure to G1 in the HeLa cells. Now, I want to come back to this question of what is more sensitive, M or G2 phase of the cell cycle. My mouse is not working. Um, and on, on the left, you can see this diagram. And what it, it's hard to see is that at 2 gray, which is the dose that we would give clinically in most examples in a fraction, M is the most sensitive. But as you go up higher in dose, G2 becomes more sensitive. So on your boards, you should not be forced to separate these two. M and G2 are considered to be equally sensitive. But if you have to answer anything and choose between those two, you would pick M as being more sensitive because it's more sensitive at the, um, at the doses that we will be using in a, in a single fraction. Um, Okay, here is uh, the colony, the, the log of the surviving fraction against, uh, th this is actually not the log of the surviving fraction. This is the surviving fraction against time after shakeoff. So it's again, not a typical survival curve, um, but what we can see here 
is that the response for HeLa cells is very similar to what we saw for Cho cells before. We don't need to talk about this. And here are our conclusions then. Um, remember, G0 cells are outside of the cell cycle, so they don't fit into this pattern. But cells are most sensitive to radiation at or close to M. Cells are most resistant to radiation in late S. If there is a prolonged G1, there's a resistant period early followed by a sensitive period late. The cells are equally sensitive to radiation in G2, almost as sensitive as in M, and there are exceptions to these rules. And I want to stress this because I think I, I think I actually misspoke before. Um, uh, if there's a prolonged G1, there's a resistant period early followed by a sensitive period late. So late in G1 is when the cells are more, uh, more sensitive. Um, this is again showing that in M phase, one of the reasons why people believe it's more sensitive is because the chromosomes are out, the DNA is more exposed. Um, and we looked at this, we saw this in the cell cycle, in the um, uh, survival curves, but there is an oxygen effect. Um, and the oxygen effect is going to be discussed heavily in the uh, uh, section on reoxygenation. But I want to mention it here only so that you've seen this. Uh, the point is, is that um, there is an oxygen enhancement ratio that we'll talk about later. But what that means is that during, during G2 phase of the cell cycle, the, you need about 2.3 to 2.4 times the dose in hypoxic cells to do the same damage as that dose would do in oxic cells, in S phase cells, this goes up. Um, so there is a variation in the cell cycle uh, for um, this oxygen effect, um, but there's almost no therapeutic significance. So it's an interesting observation, but it doesn't apply clinically. Okay, does this happen in vivo? The answer is yes, it does. Here is uh, the, uh, the survival curves. This is um, the, the surviving fraction. And this is log of the surviving fraction against time after exposure. Um, and this is all done in jejunal crypt cells. So there's an assay called the jejunal crypt cell assay. In that assay, what we're doing is we're looking at the gut cells that have been irradiated. And when they grow back, they grow back an entire villus that comes from a single cell. So it's kind of a way of doing a colony forming assay inside a whole, uh, whole animal. Now, I need to point out, we will, this jejunal crypt cell assay is going to be very important. We're going to talk about it repeatedly in here. Um, it's being used in this example to look at radiosensitivity during the cell cycle um, in, in, in the, in the um, jejunum. And so what we see is they gave these animals uh, hydroxyurea in order to synchronize them in the cell cycle, and then they followed the progression. And here you can see that the patterns here look very much like the patterns we saw for the cells in culture. Patterns were virtually identical with the in vitro um, cultures. And then here is the gamma rays. Here is the neutron data. So if one compares gamma rays to the high LET neutrons, no matter whether they are, uh, what the energies are, at the end of the day, um, they all are showing this cell cycle effect. Um, it's more dramatic, however, for, uh, for x-rays and gamma rays, and we will talk about that a little bit later as well. And here's the cell cycle in the controls as it's going through. Okay, so what does this mean for therapy? So think about it for a minute. You go to irradiate a bunch of cells that are cycling. What are you going to do? Your radiation dose is going to kill the most sensitive phase of the cell cycle, kill off the G2 M phase cells and leave the cells that are most in the most resistant phase of the cell cycle. So you're going to tend to get synchronization after you irradiate, but you're not going to get equal killing. You're going to leave mostly the radio resistant cells. So one reason why we want to consider fractionation is going to be our first R called reassortment in the cell cycle. If you give a dose of radiation, and you wait some time, and, and now you've killed off all the radiosensitive cells, and you wait a little bit of time, what you're doing is you're giving time for the radio-resistant cells to enter into the radiosensitive phase of the cell cycle. So they will reassort in the most radiosensitive phase of the cell cycle and allow us to be able to uh, get killing of the sensitive cells again. And as we repeat this, repeat this, repeat this with fractionation, we're going to get better killing 
of the tumor cells than we would if we were giving all the radiation in one dose. So this is an advantage to fractionation is this reassortment in the cell cycle. Now, is this gonna benefit, is this gonna be good for normal cells or for tumor cells? Well, tumor cells are of course gonna be affected because they're cycling. If you have non-cycling normal cells in the tissue, they will not be affected. If you have a tissue that is heavily cycling, then you may have some problems with normal cells as well that will also reassort during the cell cycle and go to the more radiosensitive phase. So this is reason number one why we fractionate, reassortment in the cell cycle, allowing us to get the most radiosensitive cells in the cell cycle. Now the technique I alluded to earlier that I wanna talk about in detail um, for a moment is flow cytometry. This is definitely on your boards, so let me do my best uh, to explain it. It's not explained. It is explained later in Hall's text in a very cursory way. Okay, so what happens? Flow cytometry, let's think about those uh, BR, BDR labeled cells. What do we do? We add a BUDR, which uh, incorporates into the newly synthesized DNA. We add an antibody that can be detected by fluorescence. We have a laser beam that can detect the, that shines a fluorescent light on the cells. We have a fluorescence detector, which detects it. And here's our plot. Um, what, we do, what we plot is the number of cells. So each axis quantitates the cells and the, against DNA content. What cells do we expect to be 2N? cells are in G1, maybe the G0 cell, cells. Which cells do we expect to be 4N? The cells that are G2 and M. And what do we expect to be in the middle? Those cells that are in S phase. There was a, um, a board's question that asked you to label this plot on the boards, I guess about four years ago now. So I would know this plot. But um, there are other things that we can do with this. We can sort cells. So you can sort cells that have a label versus not uh, based slightly on charge using, um, again, the laser beam. But the most common application is this one I'm gonna show you now, which is a dual label situation. So what's done in these experiments most commonly is you add a dye called propidium iodide, which is a red dye. Propidium iodide labels all the DNA within the cell. Regardless of whether it's synthesizing or not, it labels all the DNA. Then you add bromodeoxyuridine and bind to it an antibody that is fluorescent green. So you're comparing red fluorescent color to green fluorescent color. You do a plot here, and they actually used iododeoxyuridine instead of bromodeoxyuridine. It works exactly the same, it doesn't matter. Here's the red dye for the total DNA, and look at this plot. If it were only one dimensional, you would have seen a bump here, a, uh, a, a, a lower line here, and then another bump here. So this is, would be G1S, G2M. But now we've added a dye that measures only the cells that are synthesizing DNA. So that's gonna separate the S phase cells away from the others. So now what we can do is we can ask the question, and each dot here represents a cell. So how many cells are here? How many cells are here? how many cells are here, and we can use that to get an idea of what percentage of cells are in what phase of the cell cycle. Now, just to point out that tumor cells are often aneuploid and have more uh, DNA in them than normal cells do. Here's the um, plot of what a one-dimensional plot would look like for normal versus tumor cells, and you can see that the tumor cells have a higher DNA content because they are aneuploid. You can also chase the label. I don't think you need to know this uh, example for your boards, but you can keep the label in for zero time, two hours, four hours, and follow the cells as they progress through the cell cycle. Um, this was, is used also to measure proliferation. I, I don't think we need to go through all these. These are just examples of particular proteins that are being measured. So to summarize this topic, the greatest length and variation of cell cycle from one cell type to another is in the length of its G1 phase. If we look at those cells that are in the cell cycle, not G0, but those cells that are in the cell cycle, 
M is greater than G2, is greater than G1, is greater than early S, is greater than late S in terms of its pattern for radiation sensitivity. The in vivo and in vitro patterns appear to be very similar. And with that single dose of radiation, there will be synchronization. Fractionation helps to avoid that. We call that reassortment. And that reassortment is the first R in radiobiology.